Hey folks, Paul Abernathy here. Welcome to another episode of Fast Tracks Live, where we look at the National Electrical Code. And on today's episode, we're gonna be critiquing a video that we found that is talking about five code violations that this electrician found that talks about its association with hot tubs. So this is obviously dealing with Article 680, and I thought it was a great video for me to give some additional insight to, and also, you know, bust some of the myths that come up in videos from time to time. Uh, again, uh, you have to be careful where you get your source of information, but you can always trust FastTrackSystem.com in the courses we provide. But every now and then there's a video out there that we wanna make sure that we're not doing it to belittle or berate anyone. We're just simply critiquing it and adding some additional commentary and insight to it. So without further ado, let's go on and get into that and we'll critique this video. So for those that just jumped in, we're gonna be looking at hot tubs and an, a video that's pointing out five things and we're going to try to critique it and let you know what's true and what's false. All right, so let's go on and get to it. GFCI protection, water and electricity do not mix. Hey, it's Joel Walsman, CEO and master electrician of Jefferson Electric. This video is top hot tub code violations and minimum standards. Each one of these code standards is going to be referenced in the description below. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of you having to reference them, I'm going to reference them, I'm going to show them and point out some specific things that he may say. Now, I'm again, I'm not here to critique anybody, but when you say that you're uh, an academy, it's very important because you're teaching people. So you wanna make sure that we provide them with accurate information, okay? So again, nothing against the gentleman. I'm just, it's important to me that when we say things in a video, that we understand what we're saying and we make it very clear, okay? So let's go on and get into it and uh, see what you've got. Code minimum standard number five, having a service outlet within sight, but out of reach, of the hot tub. This outlet is required to have two characteristics. One, GFCI protection, and two, a while in use cover. A while in use cover allows for a extension cord to be connected and the cover fully seated and latched for a rain tight connection. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. So interesting is the in use cover in a wet location is something that is not in 680. So it's not really germane to the hot tub rules and things like that. Uh, it, it's covered elsewhere and if it is outside and it is in a wet location, then you're gonna use an in-use cover. Now, obviously if it's in a damp location under canopies, then you can use the flips type that are not with an in-use cover. Obviously this one is open and exposed and so it would be an in-use cover. Okay, since this video is about hot tub and spas, I'm not gonna go look that up. You should know that. So yes, in-use cover, perfectly fine. Now, what we are going to address is the distance issue. So the first thing he talks about is the receptacle is to be within sight, but he says not within reach. So we need to add additional clarity to what you mean in reach, because that's a bit ambiguous. So what we're gonna do is we'll go to the NEC and we'll look and see what he's talking about here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go down and we're gonna get to receptacles. Now, first thing I also remind you that when you're looking at part four for hot tubs and spas and the outdoor application like this one, it's gonna very much tell you that you still have to meet part one and part two of this specific codes uh, article. Okay, so we still have to meet part one and part two as if it was a permanently installed pool. Now, obviously there's some allowances for like the equipotential bonding and that, that fall down under part four that is unique, okay? But we're looking at the general requirements right now that are be covered in part one and part two of article 680. So, um, so let's go down real quick and we're gonna be jumping into part two. 
And again, I'll show you why we're in part two once we get there. But we're going to be looking at 680.22. So here is the required receptacle and its location that he's talking about. Now, maybe that receptacle wasn't installed just for servicing that hot tub. It could be a receptacle that's maybe servicing the back of the actual dwelling. Nevertheless, a receptacle is required. And where is it required to be located? Well, it says where a permanently installed pool is installed. And again, remember that it says back in 680.42, it says, oh, by the way, you still got to meet part one and part two of 680. Okay, so that's why we're back here for anybody that says, wait a minute, we're talking about a hot tub, not a permanently installed pool. It tells us that we follow these rules in part two. All right, so the receptacle installed no fewer than one 125 volt, 15 or 20 ampere receptacle on a general purpose brand circuit, nothing special, just a general purpose brand circuit, shall be located not less than six feet six feet from and not more than 20 feet from the inside wall of the pool this receptacle shall be located not more than six and a half feet above the floor platform or grade level servicing the pool okay so in this scenario right here it's not saying anything about within sight but what it's saying is that it has to be what it can't be closer than six feet right and it can't be more than 20 feet. Now, obviously, the one in the video uh, wasn't more than 20 feet away. But what I do question is whether that was less than six feet. Okay, I do question that. Now, since we can't measure it, I just wanted to use that for informational purposes only. And uh, that, that would be all for that one. Now, also, here you just see the GFCI requirement. Right, all receptacles 125 volt through 250 volts, 60 amperes or less, located within 20 feet of the inside wall of the pool. In this case, it's also going to apply to the spa or hot tub. Then it has to have GFCI protection. Okay, so that's where you get all of those rules. So he's right to that point. Okay, all right, so let's go. But again, I think if we measured it, I don't know that it's six feet, but we'll take it, we'll take what he says and we'll go with it. All right, so let's get on back to the video and watch a little more. Code minimum standard number four, the GFCI disconnect with insight, but also out of reach of the hot tub. Okay, let's pause there for a second. So he says not within reach and not out of sight. So. First thing to remember, this is obviously a residence, so it's not a requirement for an emergency disconnect, but it does require a maintenance disconnect, okay? And it would be GFCI protected, but where do we get that rule? So let's go to the code really quick, and we'll get into here, and let's go down. So what we're looking for is we're gonna be coming back here to part one, all right? And again, at the end, I'll show you why we're using part one and part two for a hot tub or spa, okay? So here's our maintenance disconnect, all right? So here's the maintenance disconnect, and here's what it says. One or more means to simultaneously disconnect all ungrounded conductors shall be provided for all utilization equipment other than lighting. This is not what we're talking about, the lighting. This is for the hot tub. It says each means shall be readily accessible and within sight, so he's got that right, and we all know within sight, it is not more than 50 feet. And the definition of within sight is in Article 100. So you can go read that. It says from its equipment and shall be located not less than five feet horizontally from the inside wall of the pool, spa, hot tub, uh, fountain, or hot tub, unless separated from the open water by a permanently installed barrier that'd be like a wall. And if there was a wall there, then it provides for a five foot reach or greater, okay? So if we were to go back and look at the picture, is that disconnect uh, not less than five feet away? Hmm, I don't know. We'll go back real quick and look at the image and I'll rewind it back just a bit. So we'll go back and look really quick and I'll just rewind it back a little bit here. Let's stop right here. Okay, so 
One of the things, let's go back a little further because I want to get that banner out of the way. There we go. Let's stop right here. Okay, so if we look at this here, first of all, I will tell you that I'm a little concerned about the under his elbow, there's a switch right there. Okay, so that is a switch, and we'll see that here in a second for that clearance. But just so you know, it also has to be at least five feet away. So if that's the disconnect or the one that's open underneath that Rainbird controller for a sprinkler system, either way, I am not sure that that is more than five feet away horizontally. Okay, But I certainly don't believe the one that's just under his elbow if that switch is. So what governs that one if that is not the maintenance disconnect for the hot tub? Okay, so what governs that? Well, let's go back real quick to the NEC and we'll go down and say, okay, so now that would take us down to, um, we'll be back in, let's see here. Let's get, let's go back to, here we go. Okay, we've got lighting, receptacles, and equipment. All right, so under receptacles, we got lighting, yada, yada, uh, and we got existing installations, and then we got switching devices under equipment. So I don't know what that disconnect was for, but it says switching devices, and I would say that is a switching device located at least five feet horizontal from the inside wall of the pool unless separated from the barrier. Same type of scenario. So I have at least an issue with that other switching device that's there as well. Now, granted, I can't measure all that, but I wanted to point out that this would also apply if you happen to put a light switch near there. Again, that would also be a switching device, okay? So anyway, all those things are additional commentary to think about. Obviously, that location looked a bit cramped, and so again, maybe he does have that distance, but if he does, he sure is pushing it. I can tell you that right now. All right, let's go back and listen a little more. Four, the GFCI disconnect with insight, but also out of reach of the hot tub. Also, it's kind of interesting when he held his hands out like that. I don't think that that's five foot span, okay? Um, but maybe he's a big dude with a big wingspan. I don't know. I'm just pointing these things out. I'm not, I'm not criticizing the guy. I'm just trying to add a little additional detail, okay? All right, let's do a little more. Violation number three, wire type, color coding, and size. With respect to type, this is an outdoor installation. That wire has to be rated for wet location. Even though it's an, in a conduit and in a hot tub, those are considered wet locations by code. Okay, correct there. So where does it tell you that in the code? So if he's using a raceway method, Okay, then what he's got is uh, 300.9, which will say that any raceway above ground outside is considered a wet location. So the conductors that go inside of that raceway had to be rated for wet location. Now, we have cable assemblies that people make as well, like PVC jacket at MC. The conductors inside of it are rated for a wet location, and the outer PVC extrusion makes that cable okay for a wet location. Normal MC cable, for example, can't go in a wet location, but you can get PVC jacketed MC. So important to understand that in a wet location that is outside, and it is defined in Article 100 of the NEC, so pause the video, go look at Article 100, and you'll see that it's defined as a wet location, a damp location, and a dry location. Obviously, outdoors, like shown in this video, that is a wet location. So whether you're using a cable assembly, it has to be rated for a wet location. Whether you're using a raceway, the conductors inside of it, would have to be rated for a wet location, okay? Now, one other thing that's important to bring up is wherever you're putting this wiring method, it also reminds us that 680.14 talks about corrosive environments and things like that. And there's a lot of debate on whether or not the area outside 
just in the open is a corrosive environment. Uh, again, everybody says water's corrosive, but it's not nearly the intended corrosion that you would see whether or not you have pool chemicals or in a storage building where they're storing pool chemicals and things like that, okay? So just keep those things in mind. Um, but remember, outdoors, wet location, wet location rated products, okay? And the wire insulation has to be rated to handle that environment. And also a quick reminder that if you go into the code in 310, you're gonna see where it talks about the different wire types. So all you're looking for is that W rating, like a THWN-2, that's a wet location rated product. XHHW-2, that's a wet location type conductor insulation. And then you would put it in the wiring method of choice. Again, you could buy a cable assembly that is already rated for use in a wet location, all right? Then there you go. That would be perfectly fine. That means the conductors inside of it are gonna be rated for a wet location. Number two, color coding. Hot conductors, neutral conductors, and grounding conductors are all specified a color according to their color type in the code. Okay. That is not correct. Now, it is correct for the neutral. So the neutral in Article 200 would be, you have to have white or gray, or you could have three white or gray stripes so on any color other than green insulation, and that would be acceptable in six gauge and smaller, right? And if your conductors happen to be four gauge and larger, guess what? You can follow all those rules for color coding the same way, or you can do what's called field marking, which means that I would mark it at each end of the termination, right? So as long as it's four gauge and larger, then I could mark it in the field. And that's what a lot of folks will do. They don't want to carry six gauge, even though it's probably the most common size for normal hot tub applications. But a lot of times they'll carry it in four and do everything in four because they know that they can re-identify the uh, a conductor, a black conductor, as the grounded neutral because of the allowances in the code. Now, where does it say that in the code? Let's go on and look so that we make sure that we cover all that. So I wanna take us all the way back to 200. And here you're gonna see in 200.6, which is the means of identifying the grounded conductor. So you see six and smaller, then it can be continuous white or continuous gray, or here's where you got the three continuous white or gray stripes on any color insulation other than green. So you can't take a green conductor and insulate it, okay? I mean, green conductor and put three white or gray stripes on it, I mean, can't do that. But you could take a black conductor, a blue conductor, whatever, and put three continuous white or gray stripes on it if that's what you wanna do, all right? Now, the one that I talked about in four gauge and larger, is down here. You still have the continuous white or gray options, still have the three continuous white or gray stripe options on any color other than green, but down here at the time of installation, when it's four and larger, then you can re-identify it, right, with distinctive white or gray markings at its terminations. So that's why people sometimes would just carry the four for these hot tubs. That way they can just get a bunch of black, maybe they buy it in bulk, and they don't have to worry about the color coding because they can identify it in the field. Makes sense? So that is something that you have to do. Now also, uh, one of the things to remember is if you're using a cable assembly for this and the cable assembly is rated for a wet location, then here you have an allowance to re-identify another conductor in this cable assembly, right? You can re-identify it as a grounded conductor. So let's say I have black, a red, a blue, and a, a white. Or for some weird reason, I want to re-identify the blue as a grounded conductor, regardless of its size, then yes, I could re-identify it and use it to get that, uh, to create a grounded conductor. That's what this is saying. So a lot of people read this and get confused about this part that says four or larger. All that's doing is reminding you the rules that we just looked at. If it's four or larger, you're already allowed to re-identify it for those rules. But this exception down here overrules all of that and says, look, if it's a cable assembly, then I can take 
any of the conductors that are in there and I could re-identify it and make it a distinctive white or gray marking and I could use that as a grounded conductor, okay? Makes sense? Okay, so that's what this is saying that you can do in here, all right? So I just wanted to make sure that you understand that if you get a cable assembly to do this. Now, I also will point out that 200.6, these up here are talking about raceways. This rule down here where I just talked about a multi-conductor cable, like a PVC jacket at MC or something like that, this exception only applies to a multi-conductor cable. Does not apply to a raceway application. In that application, again, six and smaller, it's gotta be white or gray, or again, any color other than green with three white or gray stripes. Uh, or if it is four and larger, you could re-identify it at the terminal, okay? That means so you can wrap it at each end with white tape and be done. We all clear? Okay, I just felt like it's important to elaborate on that for folks because you never know what you're carrying in your service truck uh, and we don't wanna see you taking a six gauge black and trying to re-identify it uh, in the field with white tape on each end. Couldn't do that in a raceway, okay? So just keep that in mind. All right, so let's get back to the video and do some more critique. Mixing colors and wire purposes is a violation of code minimum standard. The typical color coding sequence that's gonna be used for a residential hot tub is black for line one, hot one, red for hot two, white for neutral, and green or bare for ground. Okay, let's stop him right there. There is absolutely nothing in the National Electrical Code that requires color coding like that black on line one, red on line two, doesn't matter. Single phase applications here, doesn't matter. But if you wanted to use any color you want in a residential application, other than obviously grounds, uh, green, uh, obviously other than neutrals, white or gray, they're applications we just discussed. When it comes to the ungrounded hot conductors, if you wanna use lavender and purple, go for it. If you wanna use whatever colors you want, that is up to you. Now, the only exception to that is if you have a local jurisdiction that is very specific about the colors that they want you to use. And that is pretty rare on residential applications. But if they do, you use what they tell you. In a commercial setting, it's very common to use black, red, blue um, when it comes to 122.40 or 122.8. And then 277.480, it's brown, orange, yellow and they'll use a gray for their grounded conductor. That is not in the National Electrical Code, by the way. The only color coding requirements in the code is when you're using equipment grounds and you're gonna insulate it, you have to use green or green with yellow stripes. Um, if you're going to be using the neutral, then the neutral is white or gray. And as we previously talked about, it could be any color other than green with three white or gray stripes. Those are your color requirements. Now, the only other one is when you have a delta high leg, and that was going to be required to be orange. Now, it's only required to be orange if you're using colors to establish the identification of the high leg. If you're using labels or tags or some other means that's acceptable to the AHJ, then even the high leg wouldn't have to be orange if you're not using a color system. So if I'm using uh, just all black insulated conductors and I'm identifying with numbers or tags or labels, then that would be an acceptable method probably to the AHJ and you'd be okay. Uh, this is a single family dwelling application. Obviously, there is no color scheme. If you wanna go black line one, red line two, totally up to you, but I want you to know it is not dictated in the National Electrical Code. I told you what is dictated, but the ungrounded hot is not dictated by the NEC. Okay. Violation with wire type number three is... Oh, also I should mention, I forgot to mention. He said that the equipment grounding conductor in these type of hot tub applications can be bare. It cannot, all right? So let me take you that real quick and show you. And I am the 2023 edition of the NEC. It's important that I make that clear. So let me take you back here. Let's go back to 680. And let's take you to 680 and we'll go under part one. And I'm in 680 and we'll go down to 680. And we're right here under 680.7, grounding and bonding. Okay, of the 2023 edition of the NEC, it says 
feeders and branch circuits installed in a corrosive environment or a wet location. So we don't have to even get into this code panel 17 argument. Don't get me started on, and I'm on that code panel. So we don't have to get into the, the whether it's a corrosive environment argument here. We know that it's a wet location outside. So wet locations shall contain an EGC, which is an equipment grounding conductor that is insulated copper conductor size in accordance with table 250.122, but again, not smaller than 12 gauge. So it's probably gonna be larger than 12, but it, it can't be smaller than 12, okay? So it has to be insulated. So the gentleman said bare, not what's gonna be applicable in this application under 680. It's going to feeders or brand circuits installed are going to have to have an insulated copper conductor, right? And so specifically here, because he's going from that disconnect down to the actual hot tub got to be insulated okay in that application all right okay just wanted to point that out before we move further gauge or size code table 310.16 specifies wire gauge that wire gauge has to be multiplied by 125 percent to handle the impacity of the hot tub that's because the hot tub under normal operating conditions is considered a continuous load it okay we got to stop him there again folks a hot tub is not a continuous load it is not the definition of a continuous load is a load that operates at its maximum output for three hours or more. A hot tub has motors, it has different heat cycling on and off. It is never going to be operating at its maximum output. Could, is it going to be running for more than three hours, maybe heating and different thermostatic controls? Absolutely. But when you're sizing this, you're going to the nameplate. The nameplate already is taken into consideration. The motor that's on board, the heater that's on board, everything has been taken into consideration to create that nameplate. And it's going to tell you in the installation instructions, the size conductors you need, the disconnecting means size, everything is going to be in the instructions that are supplied by the manufacturer of the hot tub. It is not in of itself considered a continuous load because you are not going to have it pull the maximum value for three hours or more. Now you're probably saying, yeah, Paul, but it's going to be on for hours. That's why you got to go look at the code. So let's go look at the code and look at the definition of a continuous load. So I'll take us there. So here we are back into the code and we'll go to article 100 and let's go on down to continuous load so that we can see what it says and you tell me what you think. So let me continuous load, let me find it here. I will eventually find it, I promise you. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see here, Paul, where you, okay, here we go, continuous load. All right, electronic versions sometimes get you. All right, right here. Continuous load. It says a load where the maximum current, maximum current is expected to continue for three hours or more. So this is the same reason why we don't do your range in your house as a continuous load. It may be Thanksgiving. You may be cooking a turkey. You might have that thing on, but it's not at its maximum current for three hours or more. So that's different, for example, if you have lighting in a commercial building where those lights are going to be at their maximum output burning all day long, they obviously are going to be at 100% and they're going to be burning all the time. So we take those as a continuous load. Even if you could turn it back, somebody could run them at their maximum. That's why we take the lighting as a continuous load, okay? But in this case, a hot tub is not considered in itself a continuous load. Follow the nameplate. Don't just take the value off the nameplate and then do it at 125%. Follow the instructions from the manufacturer. They already take this stuff into consideration. So again, make sure you don't look at a hot tub and say, hey, that's a continuous load because I can promise you 
it is not pulling its maximum current for three hours or more. It is not. It's going to cycle on and off, on and off, on and off. And if it's just sitting there running, it's probably not going to have the lighting on. That's a load that's got to be figured in. Also, if you're in it, you're not going to be sitting in it at its maximum value, the highest setting for three hours or more. It's just not going to happen. So we don't take it. Trust me now, with the motors and all those type of things that are at 125%, that is all figured into the actual uh, hot tub itself when they produce the instructions and the values on the nameplate and what they give you in the installation. So again, don't look at that as a continuous load by itself, okay? All right, let's go on. Could operate in cold weather and high use for three hours or more. So the ampacity of the wire has to be sized to handle 125% of the nameplate capacity of the hot tub. That is not true. That is, that is not true. It is not a continuous load, okay? This is already factored into what they tell you to size everything based on the installation instructions. They've already done it for you, okay? Do not, please, doesn't matter if it's cold weather, you're not going to be running the water heater at its maximum current draw for three hours or more. It's not, not going to be doing it. So you do not have to take it as a continuous load. Reiterate that. In this case, we used six gauge conductors to handle a 40 amp hot tub. Typically hot tubs will be installed on 10 gauge, eight gauge, or six gauge conductors. Code minimum standard number two, separation of grounds and neutrals. After the main point of disconnect of service power to the home, grounds and neutrals must be separated. It is often the case that installers will conflate, reverse, or combine grounds and neutrals. And that is a direct violation of the National Electrical Code. Okay, so where is that a violation in the NEC. So that's actually a violation that pulls you back to Article 250. So we'll go look at that. It prohibits what's called improper case to neutrals downstream of the service. So when we hear us say things like improper case to neutral, that means the neutral inadvertently coming in contact with the grounded case or the metal equipment. Where do we see that in the code that prohibits this application? Again, it's not specific to 680, but it is covered in 250. So we'll go on and go to the code and we'll go on down to 250. And you're gonna be looking in section 24 so, and, it, and actually, I believe it actually changed in the 2023. So let's go look. So let's go look and see where it is. Many of you are going to remember it in 24. But let's go to 250 and we'll go. So here's 24. This is where it used to be, right? So improper case to neutral. But guess what? It got moved, right? It got moved. And I know it's, uh, let's see here. Hold on here, let's go a little further All right here. Uh, so this is a supply, so no, it's not there. So it got moved, but where did it get moved? It got moved where it separated it out into its own B. So previously, I believe it was 250.24A5. Don't quote me, I'm thinking that's what it was. But now instead of that, it's been moved to its own B. And what does it say? It says a ground conductor shall not be connected to normally non-curing carrying metal parts. That's the case part of that case to neutral reference that we make. Uh, metal parts of equipment to equipment ground conductors or be reconnected to ground on the load side of the service disconnecting means, except as otherwise permitted in the code. Okay, so not going to be allowed here for you to reconnect and take that grounded conductor and connect it to the enclosure. Why is that? Because what we don't want is circulating current. Obviously, there's going to be an imbalanced current that's traveling on the neutral back to the source. So what happens is if you were to inadvertently connect it to the case or the metal frame downstream, now you've got it traveling on two different paths. You got some of that current traveling on its intended path, which is the neutral, but you have some also traveling on the metal parts. 
If you lose the neutral, then you have the majority traveling on the metal parts. It creates an unsafe condition and most certainly unsafe around swimming pools and hot tubs and whatnot, right? So um, you want to make sure that you do not reconnect them at a remote location downstream of the service disconnect. And in your 2023 code, that's where it is, 250.24B. In your 2020, the 2020, 2020 edition, I keep thinking 2026, but we're not there yet. In the 2020 edition, it's gonna be 250.24A5. All right, cool. All right, let's get back to him and finish this thing up. And code minimum number one, GFCI protection, ground fault circuit interrupter. That is the focus and primary emphasis of article 680 in the National Electrical Code. That is this baby right here. Gotta have GFCI protection. Water and electricity do not mix. This guy's gonna trip out at less than six milliampers of current leakage. Okay, let's talk about it. Uh, this statement. So GFCIs actually function, we call it a five milliamp nominal, but what it means is if it's four or less, it's not to trip, okay? If it's six or more, it will trip, right? So we call it five milliamp nominal and that gives the manufacturers a little tolerance, but that's where we're at with it. Yes, this is required to be GFCI protected. Those receptacle outlets that are outside, GFCI protected, uh, all of that uh, has got to be GFCI protected. Then again, I will remind you that that service disconnect, that disconnect that's underneath is the meter, all of that to me looks like it's closer than five feet from the top inside edge of that hot tub. So that brings me to this last piece. You wanted to know why am I pulling all of these rules in part one and part two into this? Because you're saying it's a hot tub, Paul. It, it falls under part four. Well, let me explain that. Let's go look at the code. So I wanna take us all the way down to part four of 680, okay? So let's take us there. So here's where we're at. We're at part four right here, okay? Permanently installed and self-contained spas and hot tubs. You know, the ones you buy that are already contained in a frame and everything, all right? So we don't have an emergency disconnect, right? Because what? We have a maintenance disconnect. Emergency disconnect, even though it might serve as one, it's for other than one family dwellings. So this is obviously a one family dwelling. So it would apply to multifamily dwellings. It would apply to uh, two family dwellings, but not one family dwellings. Okay. Um, here's what we're looking at. 680.42, outdoor installations for these hot tubs and spa. That's what this gentleman has. It says a hot tub, excuse me, a spa or hot tub installed outdoors shall comply with the provisions of part one and two of this article. That is why we brought in all those requirements in part one and part two, okay? That's important. And this is where we get that. Now, it says, but you also have some allowances here in 680.42a and b and this is the ability to connect flexible connections to the hot tub or spa and also the bonding we're talking about things like the equipotential potential bonding grid that's required in 680.26 you have some allowances here that you might be able to apply okay and then, of course, underwater luminaires, it's going to send you back to follow all of the same rules that are in part two that are in 680.23. That's in part two of 680. So that's your outdoor location, and that's what's going to send you back. So there's a whole lot of other things that are associated with the hot tubs and spas. Here's what I want you to do. If you're one of our Fast Tracks tube subscribers, I have an amazing eight part series over on Fast Tracks Tube that's included in that annual subscription. You get all parts and we cover in detail every piece from permanently installed to storable pools to hot tubs, to hydro massage, therapy bathtubs, all of those type of things are covered in that video series. It is worth the annual fee of $99 by itself. But if you're interested in that, 
Go check it out. It's at FastTracksTube.com or FastTracksTV.com and check it out. All right, folks, hopefully you got something out of this video. There's other things that we could cover here. We could have talked about equipotential bonding, what's required there, but we just wanted to critique the gentleman's video, give a little extra commentary. I'm not pointing anything out bad about the gentleman. I just wanted to give a little extra detail. Hopefully you got something out of it. Till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless.